All right. Good afternoon, everybody. As other people are rolling in and we are admitting everybody to come in, I will take just a brief moment to uh, welcome you all to this session today. And um, we are privileged, really, to have a, like an expert in site selection and markets um, help us out with this presentation today or do for us this presentation today, today I should say. Um, I reviewed Don's bio online and was going to uh, do a formal introduction, but the bio is way too long. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I am afraid that I will omit something important because everything on it seems quite important to me. So I will let Don introduce himself briefly um, before he starts the presentation. I will also take a second to announce our Advanced Landings Academy, which is an in-person training we do on Haddam on uh, October 18th. We have three spaces left for an in-person registration, and we do um, also have an option to attend this virtually. So this is a hybrid type of event. If you are available, we highly recommend that. Um, I also will take another moment to say that due to um, other webinar that we have scheduled um, by clear at one o'clock, we have to end this by uh, 12.55. So we will um, have done do the presentation and then we will address as many questions as we can towards the end, but we will have to um, end the meeting at 11.55. With all that being said, Don, please take it. Um, take it. <laughs> Great, thank you, Renala, and thanks to Clear for having me here today. Uh, and thanks to everyone for attending. I'm thrilled with the uh, the amount of people that have signed on to this, so that's great. So this presentation, uh, as I was creating it, I was kind of struggling internally as, is this lessons I've learned over the course of my career? Or is this 30 years of frustration uh, as a planner? And I'm not sure which one it actually is. Uh, but in that context, you know, a brief introduction on myself for those who don't know me. I've been a planner for approximately 30 years now. I've worked in the public, private, nonprofit, and also academic sectors. And a large portion of my career, really from the beginning when I started all the way till now, has intersected with real estate markets, uh, market research, uh, market feasibility, financial feasibility, project feasibility, site selection, and so forth. And that has created what I think a dynamic perspective on land use, uh, but it has also put me in a position where I think I'm in this constant struggle between uh, land use, zoning, planning, and ultimately how markets function in the work. So uh, this presentation is organized into these sections. Uh, it may not flow perfectly, but it kind of starts off with some overview and then mo moves through some specific topics that I think are worthwhile and important to uh, touch on. So. Let's get going. Uh, planning, land use, zoning, and markets. And this is kind of a market overview. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, this is kind of an overview of some of the factors that I kind of view here in this. Uh, planning, or specifically POCDs, are policy documents to guide the future development of a community. When and where a community uh, I view this as when and where communities should decide and debate land use and zoning uses. I've found, you know, we discuss land use, we go through land use, but it's not until, in, in the POCD, but it's not until usually the zoning regs where we actually debate the idea of uses. And then I also find related to that maybe uh, risk aversion in the allowance of uses, we then rely heavily on special permit or other discretionary uh, permitting processes. 
I come away with kind of this view that, you know, it's the POCD when we're discussing uses where we should have these debates. We should really determine what it is we want, where we want it, and then, from my perspective, allow it by the least restrictive means, recognizing that there are certain uses uh, that will require, you know, conditional use processes. Too often also in the POCDs, I find that, you know, it's about wants, not necessarily about markets. So a community will express what it is they want out of land use, uh, but with little regard to the reality of whether or not such uses are actually feasible or even plausible within the community. Land use simply put, uh, land use is how land is used. Uh, broad categories, commercial, industrial, residential, agriculture, forest, and other. Uh, now, each of those categories, we can break them down. Commercial can be retail, it can be office, it can be hospitality, uh, it can be many different things. Industrial could be manufacturing or it could be distribution and logistics and so forth. Residential, single family versus multi versus missing middle. You all understand that, I'm sure. Zoning essentially is the legal authority of the police powers of government to protect public health, safety, and welfare. And the regulation of use, bulk, bulk and area, essentially density, and then the intensity of development. In the use, the, uh, the uses the community wants by district, from my perspective, from a market perspective, should be realistic and plausible. And I'm not sure that's always the case. Permitting, uh, staff level permits versus commission level permits. Is it a zoning permit as a right by staff? Is it a site plan as of right by commission? Or is it essentially a conditional uh, use permit? And then uh, markets. What we in planning and land use ultimately call uses in the real estate market are ultimately referred to as asset classes. Uh, markets are dynamic, they shift and change and move around multiple variables. And I'll discuss that a bit more in some of my examples as I go through this. I think some key concepts in real estate are important to introduce, especially within the planning community. Uh, real estate development at the end of the day, investment or development uh, is a vehicle for uh, investment. It's an investment asset class that competes with other forms of investments, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, so forth and so on. You know, I often hear within communities, uh, you know, oh, you know, you'll, you'll hear the complaints at meetings that the developers are getting rich off of this development and so forth. But when you think of real estate development in the context of asset classes, Real estate development is actually a very risky asset class. You know, think of it right now. Uh, I think some credit unions are at, offering um, CD accounts at like 5% return. Uh, maybe in a low risk mutual fund, you could get 8% return, so forth and so on. In real estate though, the returns need to be high. And the reason why they need to be high to be high is because there's a lot of risk and I'll discuss that risk later on. Uh, and the land use process as I'll discuss later also creates a part of that risk. Market fe feasibility, is there enough demand in the marketplace, the trade area to support the development, the asset class or the use if we're talking real estate uh, planning terms. Financial feasibility, can the development attract investors, private investors, equity, and finance investors, the debt side, uh, the, uh, you know, formal institutions, banks, and so forth, uh, financing it. In each of those investors, typically in most developments, you're going to have both equity and debt investors. In each of those investors have different expectations as to risk and also as to returns. Return on investment is essentially the rate of return for equity and debt investors. 
And financial feasibility comes down to whether or not that rate of return can cover the cost of the development and also provide uh, the return. And then site selection, uh, the key process to identify a site that is both market and financially feasible and key metrics uh, are traffic counts, population, household, households, and income. There are other metrics and other considerations, but those are kind of key, and I'll talk a bit about those later. So use and asset classes. Uh, unrealistic uh, uh, expectations, and this is where maybe some of my frustrations come out. Not every community or location can have a Nordstrom's, a Whole Foods, a Starbucks, or a Blueback Square. And I'll talk more about those, I think, on the next slide. Uh, if your community wants such uses, do they match with your demographics, your number of, you know, how many people are in your community, your population, your total number of households? Do they match with your socioeconomics, income, age, education, and site availability? Uh, do they match with traffic counts? The fact is, most communities will tell me in a planning exercise that they would like a Whole Foods, or they would like a Starbucks. But if you look across the landscape, not every community has a Starbucks. Most communities have a Dunkin' Donuts, but not everyone has a Starbucks. Why? Because the market factors are different. The expectations or requirements of Starbucks are higher than, say, that of a Dunkin' Donuts. Market. Uh, are the uses your community wants market feasible? Is there enough supply and demand to actually uh, support those uh, uses? And do existing market rents support new construction? If we we're in a physical environment, not right now, not a virtual, I would ask you guys, you know, how many of you actually know the, the market rents across asset classes? What are the rents in your community for retail? What are they for office? What are they for uh, industrial? What are they for multifamily apartments? Fact is, oftentimes I've found communities don't know what those numbers are. And if you don't know what those rents are, then it's really hard to kind of make a determination uh, as to are these things market feasible or financially feasible? And then key aspects of site selection, traffic counts, populations, household incomes, and ultimately rents are key also. So examples of unrealistic expectations and planning of markets. I'm not calling out specific communities here, but these are recent experiences that I've had. Uh, there was a rural community with only about 2,000 persons in Connecticut that during an economic development uh, planning program we were doing, uh, community input session, uh, insisted on they wanted a Nordstrom's. And I remember just kind of my head spinning. Income-wise, yes, they could support Nordstrom's. Population, households, traffic counts, not even a consideration. And then just the very idea of a Nordstrom's as a standalone in this community versus as part of a large regional mall. It's just a unrealistic kind of expectation for that kind of community. Many communities over the years, ever since 2007 when Blueback Square was uh, created, have said they want Blueback Square. And my typical response is like, there's only one Blueback Square. Why? <laughs> Not that there aren't, aren't some similar developments out there, but why is there only one Blueback Square? Because it's located in the location, in the marketplace that is West Hartford and West Hartford Center that can actually support it. Uh, it's not in Wethersfield, it's not in Rocky Hill, you know, it's not in East Windsor. Why? Because it couldn't be supported in those marketplaces. Uh, a recent project uh, came across a zoning regulation, working with a client looking to do a fast food establishment, a zoning regulation that places separation distances on food establishments. 
uh, fast food establishments. Now, I understand the idea that a community may not want the clustering of such establishments for reasons of aesthetics, for reasons of maybe character, for reasons of maybe traffic. But the fact is, those types of establishments, uh, especially like your McDonald's, your Wendy's, your Burger Kings, they feed off of agglomerated economies, the clustering together. You know, think of how many places where you can drive to a McDonald's, stand in front of the McDonald's and look down the road in both directions, and you will likely see a Burger King and or Wendy's. Why? Because that joint location benefits them. For the consumer, we don't have to make a decision whether or not we want to go to McDonald's or Burger King. We can just head to that location and then make the decision. I know I've done it on the Berlin Turnpike. As you're approaching, like you realize there's a really long drive through line at McDonald's. So it's like, oh, I'll just keep on going and I'll go to Burger King, right? So that agglomeration is important and you end up with this conflict between kind of a land use regulation and ultimately the market conditions that actually help these businesses be viable and successful. A rural community approached us in 2015, uh, rural exurban. Uh, I wanna call them suburban, but they're too far out for me to call them suburban. Uh, but they approached us wanting a Panera on a specific site, a pad site to a, uh, a plaza, a shopping plaza. And they had been in contact with Panera a number of times and Panera just basically had no interest. And they asked us to help out. And me and my partner, Mike Goman, we did a quick review, looked at a few things and then told them, you know, no, uh, don't pay us. We're not interested because it's not gonna happen at that site. The traffic counts were marginal, just below a level that a Panera would probably be looking for. The site was outstanding. It was on the right side of the road for a morning commute and coffee, uh, high visibility near an interchange. Uh, but in addition to the marginal traffic counts, there was a prohibition in the zoning regs on drive through windows. And the fact is Panera is not going any place where they can't get a drive through window with a new, with a new construction site. So it was dead in the water at that point. I'll talk more about that at the end. I kind of wrap up there uh, with that example. Many suburban communities uh, with failing retail strip centers and malls uh, want redevelopment, but oppose or want to limit residential development as part of it. Multifamily residential has been uh, the strongest asset class kind of nationally in recent times and in Connecticut, and the only asset class that's actually had the strength to, you know, attract investors and actually reposition uh, commercial retail. There's also a symbolic relationship between residential and retail. Historically, it was always said retail follows rooftops, you know, it follows households. I'd say today, rooftops also follow retail. That is, any uh, property owner and or developer looking to reposition a failing uh, retail center is probably exploring multifamily residential as part of it. Why? Because if you can put residential proximate or mixed, you know, on the same site with retail, then the retail gets the benefit of a captive audience. You know, if you're coming home, uh, you know, at dinner time and there's a Panera there, maybe you'll go to Panera. Uh, on the flip side, the developer of the residential portion gets the value or the benefit of the amenity, the proximity to the retail space. So it becomes this kind of win-win. So a community whose uh, POCD states, they, and this is me paraphrasing, they want an area to be retail and restaurant. Sorry, I rushed through some of these slides, so forgive the typos. Uh, when high vacancies in both asset classes already exist in the area. And this is where sometimes I struggle with, you know, I, I do POCDs, I do community outreach. 
but there's always that struggle or tension with the idea of it's great that the community is stating what they want. It's great that a commission's commission is listening and in including those wants maybe to provide context in the POCD. But if those uses aren't feasible, if there's already high vacancies, if there's little to no chance from a site selection perspective that retail or restaurants could be supported there or would be invested in there, then aren't we creating a false expectation by just saying, but that's what the rest of the rest residents want. And that's where I find this disconnect between kind of how we plan for land uses and how real estate asset classes actually function. So some big picture market trends, I'm gonna move through this one, this section kind of quickly in the interest of time. Retail in some ways is on the road to recovery. There's been more openings in recent years than there has been closings. That's a big shift since we went through about a decade of more closings per year uh, than openings. Groceries, general merchandise, building products are strong. Uh, restaurants are recovering. Drive-through service is thriving. That's kind of a post-pandemic outcome. Uh, high vacancies remain in localized markets. And as Mike Gilman always says, it's not that the market is overbuilt, but that is under demolished. There's a lot of older 1950s, 60s, 70s, I'll just be blunt, crappy retail product out there uh, that's functionally obsolete or not competitive in the marketplace. And in some ways, it really needs to go away. Unfortunately, it doesn't, and it harms the market overall. Office sector has been really harmed in Connecticut and across the country. Uh, downtown markets, you know, are seeing vacancy rates in the 40s, possibly pushing up to the 50%. The suburban realms are seeing some of the highest vacancy rates they've seen. It's touch and go though. Certain products prospering, the class A strong product going into the pandemic has come out as the strong product on the other side but the shift of hybrid work and so forth is real and it is driving down that demand in larger stronger markets like maybe in new york you will see job growth over time maybe uh start capturing some of that vacancy in a stagnant job market like a hartford or connecticut overall that's going to be much more challenging and those vacancies will persist Hospitality sector, restaurants have ba uh, bounced back. The national chains are definitely doing better than the locals uh, just due to resources. Staff shortages and increased costs are still a challenge. Reduced operating hours uh, is a common theme. And hotels have bounced back on the leisure side, the tourism side, uh, but have struggled with recovery on the business side. And that's a challenge for Connecticut. Yes, we have some tourism. Uh, but at the end of the day, especially in like the Hartford market, uh, the hotel sector has definitely relied on business travel uh, as much as is more, at, more than leisure travel. Multifamily still strong, maybe showing some signs of slowing. Costs have increased dramatically uh, due to construction costs, also due to interest rates. Uh, there has been continued rent growth. Uh, the Connecticut marketplace seems stronger than most national markets as far as rent growth goes. Good for investment, uh, not good for housing affordability. Empty nesters, dinks, and new singles and recently retired are kind of the key market shares that are occupying it. And demand in Connecticut ultimately is moderate. I wouldn't say it's high or strong. Ind industrial remains uh, strong. Uh, Self-storage is really strong with the growth in multifamily and rental, the need for storage space. Uh, it has to be quality space, though, climate uh, controlled, interior access, and so forth. And logistics and warehouse have continued to see uh, demand and strength. 
and market rents overall and in the industrial sector in Connecticut have seen some improvement in recent years. Greater Hartford market rents on average retail $18 a square foot, office 20, industrial around nine. Uh, using retail as an example though, you'll see retail rents as low as $7 a square foot in Greater Hartford region, and you'll see them push up into the 40s and possibly $50 a square foot, depending on the location, depending on the kind of retailer and so forth. New construction typically requires a minimum of $30 a square foot to justify the investment to return. Therefore, that becomes kind of a challenge. You can want all the retail you want, you know, all the restaurants and retail that you want, but if the market can't support a high rent, then that new construction's not going to occur. And that becomes problematic, I think, on a planning and land use side. So understanding some market dynamics. Uh, I used to think NIMBY was about not in our backyard. I think more and more over the course of my career, I've learned uh, oftentimes it's a fear of change. And the fact is change is inevitable. Simply put, things change. We can't really control that. Uh, change is neither good or bad. It has desirable and undesirable outcomes. That's fine. We need to figure out how to work with it. And it can produce opportunities and surprises. So the challenge is not to stop or resist change, but to embrace, adapt to, and manage change. And I think a good example of this is we see a shift in the multifamily market, the residential market, where there's greater demand now on the multifamily side than there is the single family side. But so many are so tied to this idea of single family residential that we become really resistant to multifamily because it's different, because it's a change. But the fact is the market is ultimately driving that. And the market is demanding more multifamily housing, different kinds of housing uh, than we've traditionally built. And we need to find a way to embrace that and work with that. So what drives demand in real property markets? Key demand driver, first and foremost, number one, jobs. If jobs are growing, then you'll see population growing. Population is the second most important de demand driver. If population is growing, demand will mostly like be, most likely be growing. In the residential market, you can have job stagnation and population stagnation and still have demand for housing because of household formations. Couple gets divorced, one household becomes two. Your 27 year old finally moves out of your basement and that's a new household formation. Uh, so there are ways that, you know, housing demand is driven outside of jobs and population. But the more job growth, more population growth, the stronger that demand will be. Then income really doesn't drive demand, but it kind of shows us where in the marketplace demand may be realized or that supply is needed. Real estate's an interesting commodity. My phone is a commodity, right? I paid an outrageous amount of money to Verizon to get this device. And it doesn't matter where I sell it. If I sell it here in Cheshire, where I'm sitting in my house, or if I sell it in Manchester, the same with my car. I can move it around and I can sell it in all different places and its value stays the same. That's not the case with real estate. It's fixed in location. It's non-movable. And therefore it's subject to other forces. It's subject to change. Uh, it's also durable. It stays on the landscape for a long time. That means product and it's temporal. Products built at a certain time for a certain kind of consumer. So something built for a consumer in 1950s is still in the marketplace today in the 2020s, right? So it's fixed, it's durable, it's temporal, and it still has to find a way to compete. Creative destruction, innovation destroys that which came before it. So it's subject to those forces and it's subject to or at risk of functional obsolescence. And that's what I was kind of referring to with older, crappy, poorly located, you know, 1960s retail.
in real estate there's this common idea that you know what's the three most important things in real estate you're all saying them in your head already location 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 and it's true location is extremely important but location doesn't remain consistent so in 1950s greater harford the peak value intersection for retail was g fox in downtown harford that's not the case anymore in the 1970s, the West Farms Mall was built in Farmington and West Hartford. That became the peak value location, seven miles west of where it previously was. And then in the early 2000s, when Blueback Square opened in 2007, it became the peak value location, the location that's receiving the highest value in rents. So the location is constantly shifting, moving, and changing and places get left behind. West Farms hasn't been left behind, but Buckland Hills has, Enfield Square has, you know, the Meriden Mall has, uh, Crystal Mall has, right? These locations have collapsed because the markets have changed. So the problem is not that retail is overbuilt, it is that it is under demolished. Creative destruction. Our phones today have destroyed all the phones that came before them. I'd ask you to raise your hand if we were, you know, in public in the, physically in the same place. How many of you still have a landline? I don't. I haven't had one for years. All right. I see David. He's got one. So some of us still have a landline, but the fact is they're going away. The portability of this device has reduced the need for the landline. And when was the last time you used a payphone? Or when was the last time you even saw a payphone? Once again, these devices have creatively destroyed the marketplace for payphones. I'm going to start on the right hand side of this table, of this slide. Uh, figure at top household types. Households by type, 1970 to 2012. The bottom bar there, 40% uh, of households in 1970 were married couples with children. In 2012, that was down to 19.6%. Today, it's 17.9%. Married couples with children, just above, without children, have stayed constant that whole time. What's changed? the other family households, other non-family households, but most dramatically, women and men living alone, the single person household. And that's what we see down on the bottom. Only 17% of households were single person in 1970, 27.4 in 2012. It's 28.5 today nationally, and it's 29.9 .9 in Connecticut. Two-person households have increased, and then all the three or more households have decreased. You want to know why there's a shift to multifamily demand over single-family demand? Because our households are changed. Single-person households or households without children are looking for a different kind of product. That doesn't mean single-family is going away. It doesn't mean that single-family is not going to still dominate the marketplace. But it means that there is a fair share of housing consumers now that want a different product. We need to be able to provide it, not just simply resist it because we didn't live in it. So then look on the left hand side. Food at home, the blue line trajectory uh, pointing downwards and food away from home uh, going upwards. So you could say this is groceries, this is restaurants, and look at that. We are now eating out more than we are eating in. Why? Go back to this side. Single person households, two person households. The change in household structure is changing our, our behaviors. Look at what happened to the restaurant industry over this time. 20 fold increase from 42 billion to just shy of 800 billion from 1970 to 2017. 
Well, that's new demand. That's why the landscape, or at least the retail strips, are dotted with TGI Fridays and Chili's and all these other brands that were never there before. In 1986, there were only 30 Starbucks. Today, there's 29,000 worldwide. Because we drink coffee out, we don't drink it in. Demographics and socioeconomics. Uh, for Connecticut, the story is really not good. And if we're talking about population and jobs as being primary demand drivers, Connecticut's population growth is anemic, 1% from 2010 to 2020. By county, the urban counties experience 1%, 0%, or 4% growth, while all the rural counties, Litchfield, Middlesex, Tolland, Wyndham, all experience negative population growth. Adult population's growing, that's because we're aging. And then look at across the board, Every single, the state of Connecticut statewide lost 10% of those under 18, and every single county lost those under 18. Middlesex County lost 19, and so did Litchfield County lost 19% of their under 18 population. We're aging and we're losing young people. You want to know why school enrollments are contracting in most communities in Connecticut? This is why. So Connecticut from 1985 to 1989, a five-year period, added 104,000 jobs. Over 30 years from 1990 to 2020, we added uh, 45,000 jobs. The primary demand driver in Connecticut is weak, and the secondary demand driver uh, in Connecticut population is also weak. That creates a very challenging marketplace uh, in the real estate world uh, for occupying space, for redeveloping space, for building new space. And look at this. Housing starts track stagnant job growth. Housing starts track anemic population growth. We used to build a lot of housing because we used to have a lot of job growth. We actually used to build a lot of multifamily housing, too. We weren't afraid of it. But at some point, we decided we didn't like it in the 1990s and in the early 2000s. But by that time, it was kind of too late because we weren't attracting jobs and population anymore. Yet we still yelled and screamed over the housing boom of the early 2000s when we thought the world was falling, right? So household formations, uh, the increase in one and two person households account for approximately 50% of this housing growth in recent decades, not jobs and not population growth. Uh, and one and two person households are what is driving the multifamily market. As I said before, uh, so in 1960, only 13% of households in America were single person. Today, nationwide, over 28% are single person. Think of all those household formations right there. Forget about population, forget about jobs, just single person households increasing over that period of time. This is from a community we recently did some work in, and you can just see it in the population pyramids. 2012, you know, these are the baby boomers. This is the missing Generation X, and then the millennials. This is 2023, the community's top heavy and aging, and they're contracting on the young persons. Push it out to 2028, and look at it. it's a pyramid that's kind of upside down. That's because the older population is dominating. We're not attracting a younger population. Uh, and we continually kind of shed the youngest population. This is the lower Connecticut River Valley COG region, school district enrollment from 2008 to 2021. Look at these numbers. This region of, you know, 
This region lost over 5,000 school enrollments. One of these communities today, I don't want to call them out, but one of these communities has actually lost 46% of their enrollments by 2023. It's staggering numbers. Uh, this creates challenges, you know, on the demand side. A household 65, 65 and older will spend half locally of what a household in their 30s or 40s spent. So you can't support the same amount of retail if half of your population or most of your population is aging out now. The dynamics change within your community. So site selection process, lengthy process. It involves market analysis, sub-markets, trade areas, demographics, psychographics, trip generation identifiers. You know, what side of the road are you on? Are you on the morning commute for coffee or are you on the afternoon, you know, return home for going to the gym? You know, what, what side of the road is playing out there? The traffic counts, the traffic patterns, uh, financial analysis, multiple things play into the site selection process. Uh, key considerations, visibility, accessibility, regional exposure, population density, population growth, operations, convenience, so forth and so on, and kind of these key indicators. This is a recent analysis we did in a community with a geofence, dropped it on a commercial corridor, identified how many people go through that corridor on a given day, and then queried the geofence software to tell us where's the likely place of home of these people. And that's the trade area. So that's the corridor there. And people are coming from all over the place to go in that corridor. The development process, and I think this is the most meaningful in the context of land use and zoning. Uh, the steps that kind of developing a site, let's say I want to build a Target, you know, shopping center, a Target department store. Come up with the idea, preliminary market research, evaluation and established demand, anal analysis of potential sites and ultimate site selection engineering feasibility, financial feasibility. This could be anywhere from six months to two years of work, and you as a land use commission don't even know this project exists yet. You don't see it until step seven, maybe when design starts. Maybe if you do a pre-application process and bring them early, you'll see it in seven. If not, you won't see it till eight. Uh, and then, as we all know, that can be a lengthy process going through the land use. You need wetlands, then you need maybe a zone change, and then you need site plan special permit. Uh, hopefully it doesn't get litigated because that's going to add another year or two to the process, right? Uh, and then financing, then construction, then occupancy and opening, and then management of the development. Basic financial feasibility, back of the nap, back of the envelope or napkin, you know, sketch numbers that communities could do to see whether or not their uses are plausible. Add land cost to construction cost to the square footage of space, and you come up with your total cost, $12,000, 12 million. Do market rents justify? We know that we have market rents of $25 a square foot in our community. So we assume a seven year hold. So 12 million divided by seven years, uh, that 1.7 million per year multiplied by the, or divided by the square footage gives us $34 a square foot. That's the minimum rent needed to actually, you know, make that project financially feasible. Uh, market rents are too low. It's probably not going to happen. Now, other factors do play in. Maybe that's a starting point, and maybe it can work. Uh, but just to provide that context of, are we talking about something that's plausible or not? Simple calculations can go a long way. This is one of my favorite graphics. 
it's that prior slide where I said, maybe you see that site, uh, step seven, probably don't see it until step eight. All this stuff has gone on. All these costs have been incurred. And by the time they get to you at step eight, they may be 200 grand in. They may be 250 grand in. Uh, that's why returns need to be high. Do you want to put out 250 grand and get a no? It happens every night, right? So that 250 grand or that 195,000 that I've sketched out there, if that's lost on this denial, then it needs to be made up somewhere. So it's capitalizing into every project, right? So the risks are really high. So yes, the returns on investment need to be high also. I'm going to, because I know we need to wrap up early. I know I'm running a bit long, Renata. Uh, I just want, I'm going to do this slide. It's just kind of these complexities. You guys can see the others when clear, post them. I did a parking study for a developer in West Hartford Center a number of years ago. And I, I share this because it was shocking to me. So we mapped out all the parking. We counted up all the spaces. We knew where all the spaces were in relationship to our site and so forth. And then we did some geofencing analysis and geofencing captures cell phone data. And we wanted to see what are the hourly visits? What time of day are people most likely in the center? So we know we have high demand in the evening time. We know that Friday and Saturdays are the highest demand. And then we wanted to look at length of stay. And this actually shocked me all my years of like crunching numbers and so forth. The most common visitor to West Hartford Center stays less than 29 minutes. Why? Because it's the running into Starbucks to get a coffee, running into the pharmacy to pick up a prescription, running into the eyeglass center to pick up your glasses. It's all those convenience movements and activities that are key. West Hartford's gone through a big debate over parking in the center and whether or not to cut back on on-street parking to eliminate automobiles and make more space for bicycles. I'm not saying that's a bad idea. I'm not questioning or judging the decisions that West Hartford makes. My point being is this one data set shows how important convenient parking is, even though we tend to not like it. You need those on-street spaces to be able to constantly churn and turn over to facilitate those core businesses that rely on those short things. One last quick one, a struggling plaza, a successful plaza. Do average daily count traffic counts matter? Absolutely. The lower your counts are, the weaker that site's going to be. Tra uh, traffic counts matter. So let me just go to conclusions. I'll take some uh, questions. Embrace change. Consider market site selection feasibility when planning. Be realistic in what your community wants and work within a market framework when zoning. I think if we all, I'm not saying we have to let the market dominate, but I think if we gave it more consideration than we actually give it in the context of land use, uh we would be more successful in achieving our goals so thank you renata oh thank thank you dan thank you so much dan this was excellent <clears throat> we are monitoring both chat and um participants so if you have a question please either raise your hand and we will unmute you or uh post it in the chat and we will have Dan answer it but th this was really really Great, and something that as a planner I experienced communities struggle with when deciding whether to approve or not approve application. These slides are wonderful. Um, do we have anybody who is posting anything in the chat, Dave? Not yet, no. Okay. And I do not really see any raised oh. hands either. Here we go. 
Kyle, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Yes. Don, Don, I had a question about the specifics of each corporation, for, for example, like does a Starbucks versus a Trader Joe's versus a tr uh, Target, do they have an internal financial model where they're, where they're looking at like, okay, we need X number of households at X number of, at X dollars per year per median income or whatever. Yeah. And other characteristics. Can you speak to that a little bit? Is it, is it proprietary? Like, is it tough to get information? Yeah. Regarding each company? A lot of the times it's proprietary for the individual companies. Sometimes if they're public traded, if you look at their, I think it's a K-10 filing with the uh, S SEC uh, Securities Exchange. Sometimes it's revealed in their filings. Uh, but ultimately, you know, total persons, total households within you know, three and five miles for something, you know, small, like say a Starbucks or a Panera, uh, a Trader Joe's may push out to 10 miles or so, or they may use drive times, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, so they're going to have kind of population thresholds, household thresholds, and median household income thresholds uh, that they're looking to hit. And if you don't hit on all three of those, they're probably not interested in the site. The most important one, so you can overcome like weak population numbers or weak household numbers if you have high traffic counts. In general, in the retail sector, 16,000 is kind of the threshold. If you have traffic counts above 16,000, then most are going to like the site, but you're going to still need some decent household income and density and so forth if you're below and that was the case i was talking about with the panera they had they had traffic counts around 14.5 and just with with that and the ban on the uh drive through windows uh panera had no interest that site ended up after we did years of work with them uh the town removed the uh drive through ban and 260 units of multifamily were approved behind the site and which are now under construction. And since then, a Starbucks been approved for that site. Uh, having the drive through window and having those captive households, big part in that site of finally developing. Don, I have an interesting question in the chat. Um, sure. And it's a question of balance, and it's really like what this <laughs> training in some part was about. Um, so Debbie asks, how do we balance the need for being flexible versus constantly changing zoning regulations? Do we move towards special use versus rezoning, which is the, you know, the, the part that you opened this with? Yeah. So perhaps, yeah. Yeah, so my, so... I, I recognize that's a constant challenge, that's a struggle. I'm not trying to diminish it. Uh, I think a couple things. I think one, trying to get away from trying to list out every single commercial use that there is, is a more flexible approach. So if you can define what retail is, if you can define what personal service is, uh, if you can define you know, your restaurants by categories, full service, fast casual, fast food, uh, if you break things down into general categories, those will capture the shifts and changes that happen in the marketplace. If you try and list out every use that exists today in the world of retail, then that's when you run yourself up against your uses are constantly, you know, not matching with market conditions and so forth. So I think part of it is just looking at things a little bit differently. Um, I do have I do have a question in chat, but uh, it's not very specific. So where you were asked, well, what is your experience uh, with mixed commercial versus residential? But I'm not sure what's the question behind that question. <laughs> well, let, let me answer that a little bit. Uh, th this is another good way where kind of, this is a good example where market and planning don't match up well. Uh, the planning, you know, desire for new urbanist mixed use communities 
uh, is reflected in so many zoning reg regulations and POCDs. Uh, what's been found in the marketplace is the residential over commercial is probably the least common product that's been built out there. Yeah, Blueback Square has it. But what's more common is what I actually call mixed proximate. Evergreen Walk's been going through it. Uh, apartments built on the same site or proximate to the site, but not over. And there's a few things that go on there. One, from a building code perspective, you can build an apartment building as a three-story walk-up, no elevator, so long as you meet your ADA on the ground floor. But the moment you put residential over a commercial space, you need an elevator. So the cost of putting residential over commercial undermines the marketplace and therefore mm. the proximate. So many regulations say that mixed use developments must be residential over commercial. And the fact is the market struggles to actually provide that. Uh, so that's an area where we can kind of look at how do we want to get residential density in near commercial, figure out how to build it proximate, not over it. Really interesting. Thank you. This is all so interesting. I do have to stop it at this point because, do, as I said, I think we can do one more question, oh. Renata. David Parent has had his real hand up. Um, so, David, if you want to okay. go ahead and un unmute. <laughs> Um, no, it's your last comment uh, about elevators. I live in a uh, six-story condominium, and it's now 40 years old. And elevators have been a problem, you know, for about the last 10 years. And I, yeah, and I do see, you know, and, and no, it didn't dawn about me. Oh, yeah, it dawned about a lot of well, putting the residential over the commercial, but if yeah, but it's, if you get an elevator into it, you're into it's you're talking about a ton of expenses. Yeah. The other thing I'm finding is that when you talk about location, especially for like us older folks, um, you know, being in a situation where you have to have a car. And when you get to be about 85 years old, like I am, that becomes a real concern. I mean, you say, well, we, you know, why can't we build it out here? Well, people need to have cars. That is tough. And even though we don't drive that many miles a year, because we don't commute, I mean, we're in the car all the time. Well, I, mean, I mean, I'm just making those two comments, and I, I just want to go on for about another two hours. <laughs> Thank you. Great. All right. Um, we we do have to wrap it up. I I apologize, but we have a geospatial webinar scheduled to start in like five minutes. I thank you so much, Don. Uh, this was unbelievably excellent. <laughs> like I don't really know how to like use the proper <laughs> verbiage here, but it was thank great. you. And you're getting great. a lot of like great webinar comments. Um, and thank you all for attending this. If you have questions that were not answered, email them and we'll see if we can pass them over and, and get that result that way. Absolutely. Um, I'd gladly answer some written questions. Great. So, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Don. Thanks. Bye-bye.